Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Very good. Sounds like you're busy. A little bit. <laughs> Keeping me hopping, yeah. I'm off what time off. <laughs> yeah, with the convention and stuff coming up, they're having all these meetings about how we're going to do it because it's all going to be technology instead of in-person meetings. So mm -hmm. things like our convocation and things like that. And so one of the people in our meeting was supposedly giving one of the workshops at the convention, but they've told her nothing about how that's going to happen, whether it's going to be a recorded thing that they're going to show or whether she's going to do it live on zoom or so. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, hey, we still got six weeks, so six, seven weeks, so they can figure it out. But, yeah. All that time. Yeah, I think she's one of these that likes to have things planned a little further ahead. So, yeah. She knows what to do. Oh, we all should be so grateful that we didn't get hit with that, huh? Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Melinda. Yeah. I see that one of one of the people from the Garden Club, um, Beverly Day, all her family lives in Lake Charles. Oh, oh my God. goodness. Yeah. Most of them had evacuated, but there was a few rancher farmers that did not. Mm. That's just. That so easily could be us. Yeah. Oh, I know. And after I went through three in a one year period, I kind of decided after that, if it's bigger than a cat two, I'm leaving. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we did. That one year where we had three come right up the state. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's only so much you can take and there's only so much worth uh, yeah. <laughs> staying in one place for. I tell you, when I watched last night on the news and they were showing those before it even made landfall, uh, the gusts were as high as 195 miles an hour. That's um, a tornado. That that's catastrophic. Yeah, that's what they deem a catastrophic uh, hurricane, because mm -hmm. buildings can't withstand that kind of a uh, you know yeah. wind oh. on a sustained basis. So, um, that was something, mm. something to behold. Oh, they make out you know like well if it's only a category one if it's only a category one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? Like the three that came up the middle of the state weren't much more than a category one, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, usually most houses that are, that are built appropriately can withstand the winds of a category one or two hurricane. Um, as long as the hurricane doesn't sit around for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. You, know? Um, you know, I'm talking about like a hurricane passing through. Um, we had one of the ones that came up on our side, the East Coast, when we were down there that um, it was Gene, I believe, the second of the, the <laughs> twins that hit us. And uh, mm -hmm. that one was coming about 15 miles an hour, and then it hit the coast of Florida and just stopped. Mm -hmm. And it sat there for 18 hours just churning right off of the coast of West Palm Beach. Yep. yep. It was like, never again. <laughs> Got to Tell our boys to make a bedroom for us and <laughs> someplace yeah. over there where the hurricanes don't go. Yeah. I didn't get anything back from anybody saying they couldn't do this at 11 today. Okay. Um, I just got a message from uh, Nancy Meets just saying that it didn't work for her. Okay. 
and I'm not real sure why just the timing thing. I just got this because I just got off that other meeting, but um, mm -hmm. she said, can't make that time today, and Karen Conley isn't feeling well, so she won't be on either. Hope to see you next week. Okay. okay. And I just talked to Linda. She's planning to be on, but she had, uh, I think she had something going on um, that she was checking on AJ Ivy. He had fallen. Oh. And, um, so she was talking to one of the daughters, and I don't know if she's on that call or off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it says Jeannie Placenic is trying to join. She's on in the waiting room, but um, I don't know if she's in a bad place connection-wise or not. Actually, 11 was better for me. I just got an extra hour's worth of cooking done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah same with me. <laughs> Just switch oh, my day around a little bit. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you because uh, these meetings are supposedly every other week. Um, and rather than switching back and forth, could we consider switching it to 11 o'clock? That's fine with me. Uh -oh. um, fine with me. For a number of weeks. I mean, it's only an hour difference, and we were usually there till 11, 30, quarter to 12 anyway with, with Eucharist. So um, We're so used to the Thursday. I hate to start changing to another day. Cause yeah. No, and I don't want to change that either because I like that too. I like the Thursday with the, the prayers and the men's breakfast yeah. and stuff. That's kind of a oh, nice Thursday day for me. So I don't want to switch it off a of Thursday. But uh, yeah, good. Yeah, if we could maybe just flip it back an hour and maybe have it be That's at 11. Fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Give us all a little extra time and then we can go to lunch uh, wherever we go after we get done with Bible study. <laughs> Round the corner into the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh -huh. Thank you, Carol. That's exactly right. <laughs> you see, right. I still have my buddies in the background here. They're in yeah. Bible study today. There they are. <laughs> yeah, there they are. <laughs> yeah. After this is all over, maybe we can go to lunch somewhere else together. Yes. I think that would be that very would be good when we can celebrate our first Eucharist again together. Yep. We can do our first Eucharist together and then maybe go to lunch someplace as the uh, Bible mm -hmm. study group and break, nice. bread, break bread together that way as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that would be uh, I think that would be very nice. A very novel idea. We used to take that for granted. Yeah. <laughs> Just be able to go out to lunch after something or after breakfast after something. Yeah. Yep. So. But now we uh, we can't do it. So. Oh, mine is over there on the couch. I have to make sure where he's at. Well, mine are, these are supposed to go home next week, but their family is in Dallas, and they were supposed to be leaving today to trek home over I-10 back to the villages, and I'm not sure that's happening. Mm. I haven't heard from them. No, uh-uh. I don't think so. I-10 is pretty much done in that area. They'll have to find a new route and they got to consider where that storm is going when it leaves Louisiana and Texas yeah. area. Because <laughs> it's ahead of them, so it's going wherever they're going to be. And, exactly. And leaving a path of destruction in its course. Yeah. So it's going to be tough. It looked like it was going kind of right between, right on the west side of Tennessee, kind of in Mississippi. In Arkansas, yeah. Yeah. Mm. A lot of so I may have these little guys longer. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Miss Vicky's joining us. Yeah. Looks like connecting to audio. Right on. I don't know, right know what's holding Jeannie up. She's, hmm? she's right on Vicky time. We give yes. her a hard time in choir because she's always late. <laughs> <laughs> Fashionably late. <laughs> We're kidding you, Vicky. Uh -huh. uh, I took all my Zoom numbers and created an, a new Zoom uh, special place. Uh huh. And I put all the Zoom numbers there just in case. Yeah. I'll tell you something uh, to do too, though, just while we're waiting for people to get on. Uh, if you want to do this, if, I don't know if you use Google Calendar or not, or even the, uh, the iPhone Calendar, no. but if no. you set up a reoccurring event for Bible study, and go in and make an event and do every Thursday and then cut and paste that Zoom link into the description box. It shows up on your calendar when you go to that date. It will show the time and date and then it'll have the Zoom link that you just have to press on to go right to the meeting. So um, that way you don't have to worry about keeping it or where the email was or stuff. It'll, it'll be on your calendar every single week. 
Yeah. Well, frankly, I think that's a bit more than my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found out quite by accident. So. Father, um, I have yes. to say that that stewardship conference on Saturday that was all done remotely and online really was quite well done. I mean, even it was breakout rooms and mm -hmm. we had our discussion and they cut us off and took us back to the main right. meeting. It was it was well done. I know you might have napped through some of it, but <laughs> no, no, I, did. I was making fun of that. Yeah, my, my only complaint was and, and it's my complaint with all of these kind of things like this when people have PowerPoints. I wish they would have sent the PowerPoint to us early to look at first. Yeah. yeah. So that they didn't have to read the entire PowerPoint to us. Yes. Right. There's nothing that I hate worse true. than when someone reads something that's right in front of me, because you know I've already read it and they're like on the second line and like okay, you know, we could have done this in three hours instead of four if you had, you know, right. and really yeah, just true. open it up to the different topics and say, do y'all have questions about this? So is there anything we need to rehighlight and and kind of move it along that way? Um, but other than that, yeah, and they actually, uh, I wish the uh, breakout groups would have been more directed. Like had a group of questions for us to ask in the Baker breakout right. group instead of, okay, here we are. Anybody want anything they want to say? You know? Well, so. and you get we had one person that really took a very long time in our one of our breakout groups, so we didn't accomplish as much as maybe we would have otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All righty. So it looks like we kind of got who we are. So. Um, I'm going to go get started and people join us on late because of the time. They certainly can join us and we appreciate them doing that. And I appreciate you guys being here as we can, uh, as we continue through the acts of the apostles. Now, um, today's going to kind of seem a little bit like a rerun and we're going to talk about that as we get going, because, um, some of the things that happened in this are kind of going to harken back to things that have happened earlier in acts, <laughs> um, with Peter. So there's kind of a parallel between, Peter's ministry and Paul's ministry. And we're going to see some parallels on that today. And excuse me, just one second. Um, Jeannie just posted me. Hold on one second here. Let me go back to her and see what her problem is. Uh, reply. Yes. We are all on. We'll see if that works. I told her to log out and log back in. Oh, there's Linda trying to jump in. And there's Jeannie again. Hello, Linda. Oh, there's Jeannie. Hey, Jeannie. Hi, Jean. Yeah, I just, I just texted. Oh, I'm waiting for audio to come on. Okay. I just texted you that you, I, I admitted you into the room and then it showed you joining and it looked like it was kind of frozen. So, um, yeah, so we're glad to have you with us. Looks like it's waiting on your audio to turn on, Jeannie. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. And um, we are on chapter 13, but as always, let us open with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day and for your presence here with us. Gracious God, we ask your presence with all those on the Louisiana and Texas coast as they begin to deal with the rescue and recovery efforts from the massive storm that has hit them. And we just ask your, your presence and guidance and care and grace with all of those people that you might be with them as they go through this. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to hear your word and to explore your word in new ways and ask you just to open our hearts and minds as well as our ears as we listen to your word today and discuss its meaning to us. And we ask this in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So um, as we left last time, Barnabas and Saul had just uh, come back to the church at Antioch and they have just been commissioned 
to do their ministry, their ministry of spreading the word and spreading the gospel. And uh, so they decide that they are going to go off and, um, and uh, go start spreading the word. So they're going to go to, um, let me see, uh, there are prophets and teachers, one of those, let me see. Um, okay, that's it. So they're going to, they're going to head to Antioch to start the church there. And so that begins in chapter 13. We did read the first three verses of chapter 13 last time, right? Right. Mission. Okay. So this is going to start on chapter four. If I could get someone to read, excuse me, verse four, um, verses four through 12 on chapter 13. Uh, Melinda, would you take that for me first? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John also to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius, Paulus, an intelligent man who summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But the magician, Elymas, for that is the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now listen, the hand of the Lord is against you, and you will be blind for a while, unable to see the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Okay, so um, they they kind of start out by giving us this little travelogue of what the um, of what the apostles are doing and the areas they're going, and I think it's just for us to get an idea of really how uh, arduous the trip might have been for them for where they were going. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a simple, you know, walk five miles down the road. It was kind of a journey they had to make to get to these churches to do their work. And, um, and that tells us that when they got as far as Paphos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet. Have we met a magician before? Remember the guy that Peter met, Simon the magician, that was um, yeah. Yeah. wanting to do good works for money instead of doing good works for God. Yep. So we have a parallel here. Um, Peter met you know, a false prophet, someone who kind of dealt in the dark arts, and now we have Paul and Barnabas doing the same. And so um, apparently they were rife with magicians back in the day. <laughs> who would have known? <laughs> yeah. you know, back in the time right after Jesus. So they were all mm -hmm. over the place there. Uh, but he's with this proconsul who was one of the higher ups of the Romans. And this is important because now we're kind of getting out of the Jewish Hebrew territory and into the Roman territory. Mm -hmm. And so things are going to change, especially for Jewish people as Barnabas and uh, Paul were going into these Roman territories. But remember when we first talked about Paul, that Paul had a Jewish mother and a Roman father. So he was, he kind of belonged to both families. Okay. Um, you know, and, and that's why when we get the, they're neither Greek nor Jew, Paul's really speaking um, you know, from, from context, because he came a family that had both, you know, a, a Jewish side and a, and a Roman side there. And, um, and I'm going to get to a point about that in just a minute. Um, they, so they ran into this false prophet named Bar Jesus, which basically translated just means son of Jesus, not the Jesus we know. Jesus was a very common name in the area. So that, you know, just somebody else named Jesus, but the bar in front of a name uh, in the Hebrew means son of. So Bar Simon would be son of Simon, Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. So um, that didn't really mean anything significant there. Um, and so uh, this magician doesn't like that his, his, uh, his patron's starting to listen to these new priests. So he's feeding them a lot of false information and kind of going against them and whispering in his ear, trying to get them to send them away. 
And we get in, in uh, verse nine here, something kind of significant. It's the first time that we see Paul's name changed. Right. Um, yeah, Luke says, but Saul, also known as Paul, and the reason is because name-wise, he would have been known more as Paul, Paulus, his Roman family in this area, than he would have as Saul in the Jewish territory. So the name signifies, A, that they're in a new territory. They're now in kind of a Roman Gentile type of territory. But it's also kind of a signal of the Gentile mission. Paul is going to be known as Paul to the Gentiles because of his family, whereas he would have been known as Saul to the more um, the Jewish and Hebraic um, side in Jerusalem. So this name change signifies Paul's real calling to the Gentile mission, and that's why he will go by Paul here. Uh, but Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit, and we get once again, and I, I, you probably, I hope you, when you read this, it perked up your ears because it's about the fourth time we've read it in Acts, looked intently at him. Remember that Peter looked intently at the council and um, you know, they even said that Jesus looked intently at, um, it's the same word that um, Jesus looking at, um, oh gosh, senior moment, um, Judas Iscariot. When Judas Iscariot came, you know, and, and he was asking who will betray you, we get the same word there that Jesus looked intently at, um, at, at Judas. So um, I think it's a word that means more than just a physical looking. It's kind of a looking inside the person of, or looking inside the heart of, looking intently to see what someone is all about. So it's, it's more than, than just seeing somebody visually, it's seeing somebody for who they really are. It's like seeing the heart of somebody or where they're actually coming from when they say that. And so Paul kind of goes to him, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, you will not stop making the crooked, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Anybody sits a little irony there? Who started out their career uh, making crooked the straight paths of the Lord for the earlier disciples as a Pharisee? Paul did, right? So um, Paul has kind of gone full 180 from being a persecutor to now being persecuted for the very things that he was persecuting for. So um, sometimes the things we do in life come back to bite us in the rear end later on and we find out that the things we did, you know, kind of the karma thing, the things we did to others are now visited upon us. So um, that's interesting for Paul. But once again, remember in Paul's conversion, what did, what did Jesus do to Paul in his conversion when he knocked him off the horse? He blinded him to signify not just physical blindness, but also spiritual blindness. And what happens to our magician here, Bar-Jesus? He is also blinded by the Holy Spirit with Paul's acts. So we have these really interesting parallels of Peter's ministry and Paul's ministry and Paul's own conversion uh, that are coming back again in Paul's ministry. So, um, so Luke is really weaving this narrative tale about, uh, about all that going on. Um, so we, we've left this place and the pro-council though saw what happened. He believed and was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So Paul kind of has his first convert with the pro-council, someone who was interested in the word and now because of the, the marvelous acts that Paul's done, he's, um, he's been pulled over to Paul's side and now believes. And so um, now Paul and Barnabas are going to continue their journey. And um, let's do, if we could, verses 13 through 25 on this chapter. Who would like to take that for me? 13 through 25, continuing the version of Paul and Barnabas. I'll do it. Cheryl, thank you. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Parsia and Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Parsia and came to Antioch in Pisidia. Pisidia. Mm -hmm. On the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up and with a gesture began to speak. You Israelites and others who fear God, listen. 
The God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. For about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. After he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as inheritance for about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until the time of the prophet Samuel. Then he asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. When he had removed him, he made David their king. In his testimony about him, he said, I have found David son of Jesse, to be a man after my heart, who will carry out all my wishes. Of this man's posterity, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had already proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his work, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but one is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of the sandals on his feet. Okay, thank you. And uh, by the way, your sound's very good today. I, I don't know uh, what you did, but uh, just a better connection, I guess. But yeah, your sound was very good today. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we, we have the, this interesting thing there in this church, and um, it was the habit of... Uh, uh, the disciples, especially Paul and Barnabas, when they went to a new place, place um, they would go to the synagogue on Sunday. They would go to the synagogue to pray because remember, right now, there is no Christian church yet, okay? We're just starting to build these communities, but there's no actually real faith or buildings or whatever that you would go to like you would a synagogue. So being faithful Jews, they would continue to go to synagogue to pray to God. Um, not really unusual for us to, to look at that. So they go in and they go to the synagogue, but people have heard about them. And after they read the law and the prophets with authority, the officials of the synagogue ask them, do you have anything, words of exhortation, do you have anything uplifting you would like to say to the community? So Paul begins this speech aimed at the Israelites, and he starts the speech kind of with a little mini history of God's relationship with the Jewish people. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Remember Peter's first two speeches to the council? How did he start? He started out with God and the Exodus and coming out of Egypt and the promised land and God giving his people, you know. So he kind of tied in the whole thing about um, his message going to go back to God. This isn't some, some person who's just another person when he's talking about Jesus. So he's kind of setting up to talk about Jesus, the son of God by starting out with God, something all the Israelites in the synagogue would have understood. There would have been a lot of head shaking going on right here. Yes, God brought the, the people out of Egypt, and yes, God took them through the promised land and fed them manna, and yes, he sent us judges, and, and yes, we wanted a king, and we got David. And so he's really just kind of, as part of his exhortation, reciting this history of God's um, providence with the Jewish people so far. But he's about to, to, to move into a new direction. He, so he's kind of done the setup so that they know that he's faithful and knows the scripture and knows the story of God's relationship. But now he's going to go another way. So um, let me see here. Who would, uh, let me, let's do uh, verses 26 through 41. Can I get someone to read that? 26 through 41. About 15 verses. Jeannie, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. And then... Okay. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead 
and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated everywhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Okay, so now Paul's speech has kind of moved from a little short history of God's relationship with the people of Israel to moving toward a salvation speech, right? Um, we can't really talk about Jesus with talking about God first because Jesus is the son of God. So he's getting in with the people, telling them about God, but now he's going to switch to salvation. And he kind of does the same thing that Peter does. Remember how Peter kind of attacked the, uh, the uppers and, and, and said, you know, you are the ones that refused him and nailed him on the cross. You were the ones that were ignorant of the scripture and didn't recognize him as the Messiah. And um, we have kind of the same thing here with Paul. He said, because you did not recognize him and understand the words that are read every Sabbath. So he's kind of condemning uh, the higher ups and the teachers in the church because even though they're saying these things in church, they didn't act on him when Jesus came and, and did the very things that they were that they were saying in the prophecies. So Jesus came and fulfilled those things and because they were so worried about their own power, they didn't see it. They didn't see that the fulfillment was being um, um, unfolded right in front of them. And he talks about the whole thing with Pilate, even though they found no cause for death. You ask him to have, you ask Pilate to have him killed. So once again, kind of condemning them. And then where, when they carried him out, everything about him written was true. He was nailed to the cross, laid in a tomb, but God raised him for the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who came up from Galilee, his disciples. And so he said, and we bring you the good news. And this is the good news that what God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us that by raising Jesus, you know, he brings us salvation. Now this is kind of interesting and I want to kind of mull this over for a little bit and we can maybe mull it over till next week if we want to. But he uses this verse from the Psalm as also it is written in the second Psalm you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, theologically, that would tend to indicate that Jesus was not the son of God until he was raised from the dead and raised up into heaven. Because they're talking about this after the resurrection, right? The way he's using this psalm. So I don't know if that's Paul being confused about theology a little bit, but it's interesting to use this actual verse of a psalm which, by the way, were written by King David way before, you know, the time of the prophets and, and, and the time of Jesus. But you are my son or um, and today I am your father or mine has today I have begotten you, depending on what your translation is. But it, 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 it kind of tends to sound like they're trying to say that the father and son relationship didn't happen until after the resurrection. But we kind of know that that's not true because Jesus all along his mission said, I am the son of God, the father who sent me. Um, all throughout the gospels, he talks about his relationship with the father. So that's just kind of an interesting little speed bump to wonder why Luke in writing that would have had Paul use that particular psalm or whether Paul actually used it and was a little confused with his theology. Um, we're going to find out when we get into Paul's letters, actually, that Paul's theology is ever evolving. 
Um, in his early letters, Paul kind of had a theology, and by the time he wrote to his third or fourth church, that theology had changed, as the church had changed. And then it changed again, and then it changed by the time he wrote the letter to the Hebrews, and then it changed by the time he wrote his letter to the Romans. So um, when you read Paul's letter to the Romans, that was actually kind of his last letter to the churches. And that is kind of the letter that best expresses his developed theology as he kind of grew as a, an apostle and grew within the church. So um, it'll be really interesting as we read the, the Paul's letters chronologically to see how that changed. But that's just kind of an interesting kind of uh, maybe a little part of that story to circle for us to come back around to when we're doing Paul's letters to maybe what Paul was thinking there. But then he kind of makes this, um, makes this uh, kind of counterpoint uh, to, to Jesus and David, which John does in his gospel as well, that, you know, David was a great king and everyone loved David, 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 but David died and was buried. And when they talk about corruption here, what they mean is his body decaying, right? Uh, that's what they mean by corruption of the body is that the body fell apart. Not that he was corrupted by a demon or anything, just that his body didn't remain intact. Because remember in the Jewish faith, um, you know, the body held the, the, the pneuma, the blood, the spirit of God. And so once the body fell apart, there was no vessel for the spirit. So that would have been considered a corrupt body. Um, and so they're making that point that David did face corruption, but Jesus did not because Jesus died and then was raised again before his body could be corrupted and then was raised into heaven. So he's really elevating Jesus in this talk saying that Jesus is much greater than your own God, David. And, uh, you know, he says that uh, by Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from all their sins, from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. In the law of Moses, there were two types of sins. There were intentional sins, and then there were kind of what they called accidental sins, okay? Um, you know, if you accidentally did something that broke the law, maybe without your knowledge, you could be forgiven for that sin because it wasn't intentional, Okay. Um, if you maybe spread a falsehood that you thought was true, but it was really a falsehood. Okay, well, you violated the commandment, right? Thou shalt not, you know, spread false truths, but you didn't intend to do it. It was something that you maybe thought was true. You could be forgiven for that. But if you went out and intentionally killed somebody, that's a sin with intention. That's something that you meant to do. And there was no cure for that in the Hebrew faith. Once you committed a, a, an intentional sin against God, you were kind of for all time separated from God. You know, that was that you were kind of done for there. There was no, there was no reconciliation like we have with the blood of Christ on the cross that we can always repent and return to the Lord and be reconciled to God. Jesus gives us that. That's the link that Jesus makes between us and God. And so this would have been something that the people sitting in the synagogue would never have heard before. This is like really new stuff to them that somebody died so even by violating the law of Moses, they could still be reconciled to God. So this is really good news for them sitting there if they're thinking that they're condemned to you know a life of separation from God because of their sin. They're starting to hear for the first time that no, there is a way that you can be reconciled to God even though you've sinned. And um, he says, beware, therefore, that what the prophet said does not happen to you. And this is the prophet's talking. You scoffers, be amazed and perish for in the days I am doing my work, a work that you will never believe, even if someone tells you. And so, first of all, Jesus talked about his own work and they didn't believe him. And now the people that were there and witnesses to Jesus are talking about Jesus's work and they still don't believe him. And even the prophets were doing God's work and saying God's word, and the people didn't believe him. So Paul's really giving them a caution here about, you know, how many times do you have to hear this message before you finally start to listen to it and understand instead of being a disbeliever and, and throwing people out. And so, um, so he's about to finish his speech here. So can I get someone to do 42 through 52 for me? And that'll take us to chapter 14. 42 through 52, 10 verses. Linda, if you'll unmute yourself, thank you.
As the people left the synagogue that day, they asked Paul to return and speak to them again the next week. And many Jews and godly Gentiles who worshiped at the synagogue followed Paul and Barnabas down the street as the two men urged them to accept the mercies God was offering. The following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of God. But when the Jewish leaders saw the crowds, they were jealous and cursed and argued against whatever Paul said. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, it was necessary that this good news from God should be given first to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and shown yourselves unworthy of eternal life, well, we will offer it to the Gentiles. For this is the Lord commanded when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to lead them from the furthest corners of the earth to my salvation. When the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and rejoiced in Paul's message. And as many as wanted eternal life, believed. So God's message spread all through that region. Then the Jewish leaders stirred up both the godly women and the civic leaders of the city and incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. But they shook off the dust of their feet against the town and went out to the city of Iconium. And their converts were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we get kind of a familiar tale here, too. So, you know, who doesn't like to go to church and have such a good time at church with their sermon that people say, we'd love you to come back next Sunday and preach again and tell us more about this. And so, you know, um, and as they go through the town, even the people are saying, we'd love you to have to come back and preach again, because this is a new message. Like I said, this is a message that people in the synagogue wouldn't have heard before. They would have heard everything up to Jesus, but they never would have heard about John the Baptist or Jesus because that was all Old Testament, right? The word and the prophets, that's all they heard. And so this is really a, a new message to them. So, you know, they come back and they come back the next Sunday and wow, the church is full. The synagogue is full. People from all over have come to hear the word and jealousy rears its ugly head. Well, that many people don't come to church when I'm preaching. Is it because of something I say or they just don't like me? How come they don't like what I'm preaching on Sunday? Huh, my crowd's dwindling every Sunday. <laughs> so, so we have these, these, uh, these preachers that are really very je uh, jealous about what Paul and Barnabas are preaching and about the crowds that they're attracting. More so the crowds, because once again, even back in the time of Jesus, they feared the erosion and the loss of their power over the people. And because remember, in the, in, unlike a Roman Empire and the Jewish Empire, the religious leaders were the leaders. They were the leaders that the Jewish people came to for their cues on things. They didn't have a governor or anything like that, like the Romans did. The religious leaders were the ones that set the tone. So if the people are starting to get excited about these new preachers and aren't listening to them, that's kind of a destruction of the whole power structure for the people and so they're very angered by this but it says uh but when the jews saw the crowd they were filled with jealousy and blaspheming they contradicted what was spoken by paul remember what the great blasphemy is mm -hmm. to call in question the word of the holy spirit and who's making paul speak these words the holy spirit so the jews by contradicting what paul is saying by contradicting the holy spirit they are, uh, they're, they're practicing what Jesus called the greatest blasphemy, the blasphemy from which there is no return or repentance, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And so that's kind of a serious thing here that Luke kind of whips through, but it's important for us to know that, you know, reading this, because um, that, that's once again a fulfillment of what Jesus told his disciples. So, but then both Paul and Barnabas spoke boldly saying, it is necessary that the word of God should come to you first. Why is it necessary? Because that's what Jesus told them, right? Didn't Jesus tell them and, and the journey to go to the house of Israel first and preach to those people? And then if they don't have the hearts and heads to listen to you, then go to the Gentiles and spread the word as well. So Paul and Barnabas are doing what they've been taught. They've been doing what their, their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus, told them to do was that 
this, this great gift of grace, this great gift of reconciliation is a gift that should be offered to God's chosen people first. And that's also why Paul started out his, his speech, his address by talking about God and how the Israelites were the chosen people. And that's why he's bringing them this word because Jesus commanded it should be brought to these people first. But these people have now blasphemed against the Holy Spirit and they've now turned their face from God and so um, Paul says, since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy. In other words, Jesus hasn't judged them. God hasn't judged them. They've condemned themselves by their actions. Their actions have condemned them. But since you reject it and are unworthy of eternal life, we're now going to turn to the Gentiles. We're done with you guys. We've tried to, to drag a horse to water as much as we can with you people. And you're hard hearted and hard headed and won't listen. So we're going to go to the Gentiles, for they seem to um, accept what we're saying. And uh, for the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And so then when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and praised the word of the Lord. Many of them became believers, and thus the word of the Lord spread throughout the region. Boom, boom, boom. But the Jews did not like that, <laughs> Okay. Uh-oh, the word is spreading throughout the kingdom, even away from Jerusalem now. This Jesus, his word is starting to spread into territories far away from Jerusalem. So as they've done to Jesus, as they did to Peter, what do they do? They, insult, they incite people to false witness, to talk about the people that are spreading the word of Jesus. They bring the people in the city against them, and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the region. So I'm going to stop for just a minute because this little part encapsules very clearly once again our three main themes in Acts, right? Number one is the spread of the mission from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and now to the ends of the world as they called it in Jerusalem, the outlying kingdom. So we're seeing that first theme the really positive spread of the message to those who the Holy Spirit have come down to, like at Pentecost and like with Peter, and given them the heart to hear this message, to accept this message in their heart and be transformed. So that's an important part. Number two, we see the agency of the Holy Spirit. Paul speaks the word he speaks because of the Holy Spirit. We hear that the Holy Spirit came among them, and they were filled with joy and gladness because of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, once again, is the agent in the growth of this mission. So the mission is growing. It's by the Holy Spirit. But our third theme was also every time that happens, it gets answered with persecution. Okay? When the word starts to set in and the people start to turn away from the religious elders, it's answered with persecution. And so that's what's happening here. And we get this really, I think it's really cool anyway, um, last couple of verses. So they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Everybody remember what Jesus said to the disciples when he was sending off two by two? Go to whatever town and accept whatever house will take you and eat what is put before you. But if they will not accept you, what are you supposed to do? Shake off the dust from your sandals as a curse against their house and go on to the next place. And so what are Paul and Barnabas doing? They're shaking off the dirt from their sandals and going on to the next place that wants to hear their word. So um, this, it's really interesting when we read this just because remember, they didn't have an apostle's manual written by Jesus. Okay, there wasn't like a checklist for them to go through of the things to do and things not to do when spreading the message of Jesus. All they're going by is what the apostles witnessed, what the apostles heard, and has taught them as disciples. And it's really interesting because Paul and Barnabas have not heard this. They were not witnesses of the resurrection, right? They came later down the road. They didn't hear Jesus say this verse we just heard about shake the dirt off your sandals and go to the next place. They wouldn't have been physically present to hear that. But obviously the disciples repeated it and repeated it through oral tradition in the synagogues and stuff enough that they knew that that was the word of Jesus. To go to these towns, spread my word, 
Go into whatever houses will accept you, accept their hospitality and fellowship. But if they don't, don't get mad at them. Don't, you know, whatever. Don't throw glass through their windows or whatever. You know, don't be mean about it. That's not what we do. If they don't accept you there, shake the dust off your sandals. And what, the, and what that really means, the shaking the dust off your sandals, that means whatever dirt I picked up here, I'm leaving here. I'm not taking any of this thing of the, this house with me. Because really all you would have picked up from a house if you went in was the dirt on the floors, okay? It would have naturally, if you've ever worn sandals out in the, in the ground, you know, you get dirt around your feet, right? When you wear sandals. And so that's what Jesus is saying is, this house is not blessed to hear my word. So don't take any of this house with you. If you're not blessed in this house, shake off the dirt from your sandals and leave whatever came from this house here. Don't let it go with you on your journey because I want you with me on my journey, not those bad feelings. Okay? Whew. How are we doing on time? Doing okay? Um, hold on, I have a chat here. Let me see, does someone have a question? Because I love having questions. Uh, Vicki, my video does not work, but I'm listening. Um, I'll just say, great. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, let's chat. Okay, I'm going to send that her. Okay. Huh? I just have a comment. I Good, Cheryl, go, go ahead. Yeah, so we'll open it up here since we're at the end of a chapter. And that there was a lot in this chapter, so um, a lot of themes and stuff. So go ahead. I think it's interesting that it says the Jews incited the devout women of high standing because women weren't considered... They were like dirt. You, you're right. The typical women were. But the women of high standing, which would have been the wife of the Pharisees, the wife of the Sadducees, the wife of the, um, of the high priest and stuff, those who were married into that, um, they would have been considered women of high standing or holy women because of the rank of their husband. Okay. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, it, it, their husbands have probably already come out and said this, but now their wives are joining them in with this. And there's kind of a pointed thing here because remember um, the night before, the night that Jesus was, um, was in, captured and imprisoned, right? And they said the next morning they were going to bring him to Pontius Pilate. And what happened there? His wife came to him and said to him, I've had a bad dream about what's going to happen to you because of this person if you persecute him. You know, um, and, and so women have always played a very strong role in giving counsel to their husbands because women, as they are today, I feel, have a much better intuitive sense about emotion and about um, certain things that men have a tendency just to run right over. And, you know, um, I'm going to build a house. I'm going to build it right here. Let's get out the things and start sawing. And women kind of think, um, you might kill animals if you do that that are nesting here. Maybe we moved it over a little bit. Maybe put it by water where we got some fresh water to drink, you know. Um, they kind of, women have a tendency, I believe, to have a bigger picture things. They look at, at kind of a more socio-emotional um, um, thing with things, and they're much more perceptive to things like ESP and uh, dreams and visions, I think. And, and Paul bears that out when we start reading Paul's letters, um, the deaconesses that Paul had with him. Many of them had visions and heard God's voice and were very in tune to the spiritual side of things, much more than some of the men who were very cut and dried, checkbox, you know, either right or wrong. Um, a lot of the women, particularly in Paul's mission, seem to live in that gray area between the black and white, if that makes sense. And so um, I think particularly the women who were married to the priests and stuff would have been very revered by the Jewish people. They also would have been looked at very highly by the Greek people because they too would have been educated like their husbands were. They would have been educated in the scriptures. They would have been educated probably in a little bit of Greek. And so even the Greek believers would have looked at these women of being women of, like it says in here, of high standing, of high status within the church. 
not necessarily Jewish society, so to say. And you're right about that. Women were very much uh, a lot of times looked on as property, you know, not having their own thing. But within the Jewish church, the wives of the, of the leaders would have been looked on very highly. Okay. As, as, as their, their husband's um, knowledge and status, you know, to some degree, I don't want to say rubbing off on, but, but being, you know, contingent with their own. And so when they had spoken things about the church, people would have listened to what they said. Okay. And so that's why they kind of mentioned that about the women. I thought that was really weird too, because, um, you know, but you know, then again, we've seen with the persecution so far, you know, the men have been trying a lot to quiet this message and it's not worked so well. And uh, do you remember Gamaliel who came to the, to the, um, to the council and said, you know, you need to let these people go because if their mission is for man, it's going to die soon enough. But if their mission is from God, you're not going to be able to stop it. Um, he was a very wise man. He was very wise in what he said. And every time these priests have pushed against the mission of Paul and Barnabas and tried to persecute it, what's happened? It's grown. It's awesome because of the persecution that received. Generally, when people try to shut people down, people wonder why. And all that does is make them more interested in hearing the message that they have to say of why they're being shut down. And so what the actions that they're trying to take actually worked against them most of the time on the elders and stuff. And so they, I think they're going to maybe try the women as a tag to try to get their wives to incite the things at all because the people have not been listening to them or at least what's come out of it has not been what they've wanted to come out of it. And so they're going to incite this persecution against Paul and Barnabas. And we're going to find out this isn't the last time that this happens. It's going to continue in places they go. People who lose power because of their message aren't going to like the message and are going to, going to persecute them and try to run them out of town. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we, we say this, but that's still going on right now in this world. You know, in some of these Middle Eastern countries, um, the leaders, the, the really Islam, high Islamic and, and kind of fanatical Islamic leaders in some of these areas, like where we had, um, uh, uh, what's the name of the group, uh, the caliphate, um, ISIS and everything, um, that, that, that weren't really what I would call your mainstream Islamists that we have over here, you know, that are peacefully doing their religion. But those over there that were doing where they were, you know, beheading gays and killing women and stoning women if they had affairs and those kind of things. Um, that's why they're beheading Christians over there because the people are hearing the Christian message and it's a message of love and peace and they don't like that. And that erodes their power base. And so they have to get rid of these people. So that's still a conundrum that we face today. The people that go to preach the message of Christ sometimes get persecuted, even persecuted unto death because their message challenges the power systems and where they're preaching the gospel. And it's the same message that Jesus, Jesus teached. It's not about earthly power. It's about heavenly power. And if you give up on that and decide not to think about the earthly power and work toward the heavenly power, then all of a sudden those earthly powers don't have that much power over you. And what they're saying and doing is just lip service and it's just blah, blah, blah. And you find out there's something bigger in your life, something more important in your life. And that's eternal life, life after this life on earth, because none of us gets out of here alive, right? Um, no matter what it is, um, except for Jesus, he was the only one. So um, when we look for that promise of eternal life with him, it's not here in the earthly world, because that's very short timeline wise, and there's nothing promised to us here. So we really should be spending our time working on that, that heavenly life, that eternal life that Jesus offers us, because that's where our final treasure will be. That's where we're, we're, you know, holding things up there. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's a good question. And it's a good question of why they would use the women for that because they were, um, you know, so looked at that way, but, you know, remember even in Jesus time, Jesus looked at women very differently. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, mm -hmm. that would have been a scandal generally for a Jewish man one who's called rabbi to come to a well and talk to a Samaritan woman. 
that would have been a scandal. To sit at a table with Mary Magdalene and have dinner would have been a scandal. And so not only Gentile and Jew, but Jesus is also putting forth something we don't really get in the Gospels that much. But the, the, the word is open to women as well. You know, women are part of a very important part of God's creation. And it's really astounding to me when we think 2,000 years later that this gospel was even allowed to survive. And that some of those stories we were able to survive. Because you think they would have been edited out by the people who had such a low opinion of, seriously, I, and I'm serious when I say that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you know through time some of these stories have been taken out and some of these books have been either canonical or non-canonical. Uh, they very well could have taken those chapters of the books out where Jesus is doing things with women and said, no, a Jewish man never would have done that. We're not going to put that in the Bible. But the message from the time of Jesus' death on always included women. Women were important to the spread of the church. They were important to the spread of the gospel. And we see that nowhere in, in, in greater force than in Paul's letters when he talks about all the deaconesses that travel with him and go to these places and help spread the word and help do the service of the table. Women were huge to the start of the church. And I really, for the life of me, don't understand why somewhere around five or 600, they were pushed to the sidelines of the church and basically said that you have no power to preach, you have no power to teach, you have no power to be at the table of the Lord, because they did up until then. Women were foundational to the growth of the church. And I say that because now women are still foundational to the growth of the church. How many men do you think come to church because their wives bring them to church? Other than sitting home and what so I'm dead serious when I say this, okay. other than watching Gator highlights or watching NFL today or whatever. Believe me, most men, if they had their druthers, would stay at home and sleep in and have their coffee and whatever. But the women appropriately so say, we need to go up and spend time with God. And so the man, which is really odd because, you know, the commission is given to men to raise their family in the faith, not to women. But you know, if you want movements inside the church to grow, you need to put women in those movements. And I think the Catholic Church really stubbed their toe by putting women on the sideline for so long. Because I think if they would have put women in those places, they would have seen their church grow instead of recede. Amen. And, uh, amen. Huh? And I said amen. <laughs> yeah, amen. And, 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 you know, the Episcopal Church did it for the longest time until even with the 79 prayer book, it wasn't until the 80s that they started ordaining women as priests. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have some very fabulous friends that I went to seminary with who know as much as I do or as devout as I was, but they had a much harder time getting a call to the ministry than the men in our class did. There are still barriers up to calling a female priest to certain congregations. And I don't know why that is, because they preach the word just as faithfully as I do. They do the Eucharist just as, you know, it's in the book. You know, how far off can you get from the Eucharist? You know, if you have the charism of the Holy Spirit on you, you're doing God's work. But there's still, for some reason, seems to be a barrier to women in the priesthood, to, to complete women in the priesthood. And in fact, generally, often what I heard most from them is that even if they get a call, women are generally offered less for that call than men are. Well, you, even, even if they're in a family with the same number of children, a husband with a wife and two kids will get offered more than a female priest with a husband and two kids. Yeah, the whole female thing is still in every part of our society. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could talk about that all day. And, and my husband tells me how he would have loved for me to meet his grandfather on his father's side that this old Italian family how the men would sit down to eat dinner and the women would serve them and they would eat afterwards you know and I mean it's in every single part of our society still yeah so Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we actually get that if you read the subtext in the story of Mary and Martha. You know, we get that in the subtext of that, too, that the disciples were seated around the table and Martha served them. It doesn't say Martha and Mary sat down and ate with them. They served them. 
And so kind of the same thing, you know, the, the men were always attended to first and then the women got to do their thing. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad and encouraged that we've made the changes that we have over time. Um, I guess partly because I was raised by a strong woman who was also a teacher. And, uh, you know, I, I give a lot of my educational bent to my mother uh, and my academic feel to my mother for doing that. And my two sisters were both strongs and could kick it on the sports field, I'll tell you. They put me in the dust sometimes playing basketball and stuff. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I was raised just in my life that women were seen as strong. Now, you, you still treated them appropriately, you know, when we talk about the fair sex thing, and I know a lot of people got upset with that with the feminist movement and stuff, but, um, you know, I, I, I'd play with my sisters on the sports field, you know, just as much as I would anybody else in the neighborhood and would throw short, we'll throw elbows and trip people and, you know, um, you know, and, and they were good and they were strong and they were skilled at what they did. And they're both professionals today. And um, that was just the context with which I was raised with women. And, you know, my grandmother on my mother's side, her husband died when my mom was 12, very early, killed by a drunk driver. Well, they owned a restaurant and bar together in Macon, Georgia, my mom, uh, my grandmother ran that by herself from that time on. And that would have been in the early 40s in the World War II era. So from the 40s through the wow. 70s, she ran that restaurant by herself. I mean, did all the hiring, firing, ran the bar, ran the restaurant. Um, you know, so I, I guess what I'm just saying, I, I was surrounded by strong women growing up. And so I never had the feeling that women were less than men or the feeling that women had to be I want this to come off right, um, taken care of by men. Um, you know, that women were for some reason less than men at being able to do things. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope we get to a point in our society where more and more people come to understand that. But, you know, when you look at our society, and we talked about this last week when we talked about, um, you know, the Muslim faith still, the women are separated from the men when they pray. You still have cultures that the women are still put kind of in a back seat to the men and the men are the primary whatever in the culture. And, um, you know, I, I just think cultures are missing out on so much by not um, relying on, depending on the wisdom and the insight of women. Um, and, and I think our, I think our politics is so much better that so many women have gotten involved with our politics to have yeah. that, that kind of the message come into our politics instead of it being, 535 old white guys, you know, um, you know, I think, I think women being involved has been good. I think having more Hispanic and African American people involved has been good. I mean, we're not perfect. We're not where we need to be. Um, but I think we're making strides toward getting where we should be as a nation that all voices are heard and all voices have a chance to speak, um, in this nation. And, and I think women are an important part of that voice. Um, you know, so there we go, my two cents worth. Um, and, and that's a long way around your question, but um, yeah, um, women have not always, not always been treated that way though, I guess is my final word on that. And um, it, it was very few women that were that, that were that way. And, you know, just speaking of that real quickly, in the Roman Empire, um, women were not allowed to own property. So if, if uh, you know, a, a woman's husband died, the property went to the sons. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Now that changed later on and, and women started fighting for that power to where if the husband divorced them or died, they got the husband's property. And so that was kind of the first time that women really became in a historical context, property owners. Mm -hmm. They were never allowed to own property before. Heck, they were the property before. Mm -hmm. You know, when you read mm -hmm. in the Bible, men could give women away to another man just for looking at them sideways or wherever they were, they were like, you know, cattle or sheep or something that something that was there to serve the man. And if they didn't do it anymore, he could give them to another man or sell them into to slavery or something. And uh, what a horrible way to treat part of God's creation and to treat, mm -hmm. you know, you know, to treat some, and it's really interesting if I can just say this real quickly, because um, it gets code, uh, quoted out of context all the time by people. And it drives me nuts. Um, and I got to remember what letter it is and I can't, but there is a letter in which Paul is writing about the family and the husband and wife. 
And Paul oh. makes the comment, women should be submissive to their husband and listen to their husband. Mm -hmm. And then they stop it. There's a very important line that comes after that where he says, and men should be subject to their wives and take the wise counsel of their wives before making decision. Mm -hmm. Paul is not saying that it's just up to the men to make the decision. Mm -hmm. He's saying that we should both as a married couple be subject to each other because we are one flesh. Mm -hmm. And we should both listen to each other's advice and counsel in making decision. And it just grieves me so often, particularly in fundamental churches, that that first line is trotted out. Women, get down lowly and be submissive to your husbands and do what they say. Ain't what Paul was talking about. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> he was saying, you know, and, and that's why proof texting and taking things out of context is so very dangerous because you miss the true meaning of what the writer is writing about. And what Paul was writing about is to have a happy household. When we do stuff, buy houses, buy cars, whatever, as husband and wife, we need to talk to each other and we need to take to each other's counsel and we need to see how this is going to affect our work lives and our work schedules and things like that and come to a conclusion together, be subject to each other's authority together before we make those decisions. Because I'll tell you, when a husband goes out and buys a house and tells the wife, hey, honey, I bought a new house for us. I'm going to tell you that's not going to end well. <laughs> and I'm not the smartest knife in the drawer, but man, I would never do something. Like that. <laughs> um, and nor should we, nor should we. We should respect each other's, each other's thoughts and each other's interaction with that. So, um, yeah, so, um, boy, I've gotten way off track here. I apologize for that, but okay. I hope it was still no, good stuff yes. because it, it takes us back to our historical context, and now you know a little bit how I feel about things, <laughs> maybe as a priest since we haven't been together that long. But, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, so I see we're a little bit after 10, and so we'll go ahead and kind of take a break here and get into 14 um, next week. 14. Uh, 14, okay. is a very, yeah, 14 is a very short chapter. Uh, so maybe just read into 15 a little bit because we might touch on that a little bit next week. Um, okay. Can we try 11 o'clock next week? Does that work with everybody and kind sure. of set our new yeah. time at 11? Oh, yeah. That way we're not having yeah. to flip back and forth for every time I have a. They invariably have our clergy meetings at 10, and they're always on Thursday. So um, no, that, was fine. that would be great. Uh, if we could Father, just... will, you, will you be here next Thursday? I will, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're not leaving until Friday afternoon. So I'll okay. be here Thursday for Bible study and men's breakfast and everything. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Right. And um, as always, I thank you for your time and attention and for your, um, you know, for your discussion. And, and, you know, we can make this more of a discussion. You guys feel free, like Cheryl, to, to ask questions. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, our discussion gets a lot more interesting than what we're reading in the book. <laughs> so, I um, enjoyed it. So, thank you for letting me listen. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you feel free to chime in, too, even though we can't see your lovely face. Uh, oh, I have, to, and would love I, have to to get I have to get another um, Bible. Mine says different words. Well, the, the, oh. yeah, well, the versions are different. Um, I basically use a, 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 a New Revised Standard Version, the NSRV, because mm -hmm. that's what our lectionary uses. So if you ever hear me mm -hmm. reading something, it's going to be attuned with the lectionary. If you use an NIV, some of the words are different. The New International Version, which is one of the most popular. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use the King James, they're going to be way different because you get all the yeah. receipts. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there's message Bibles and things like that. Um, they're all fine. They're all fine. Uh, they're just translational issues. So um, read what you read. And, and sometimes it's, it's kind of cool to hear uh, the other versions okay. while you're reading yours and hear how they translate those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and see how they translate them. So um, mine's just mine because we were required to get it for seminary because it is the lectionary Bible. That's my study Bible that has all my notes. So <laughs> not going through that again. Um, but anyway, so yeah, um, uh, good translations are, are, are nice to have different translations just to see kind of how okay. the scripture has evolved as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just don't bring one of those Bibles where they talk down to women and stuff. I don't like that. <laughs> oh, I, I don't. I don't own one of those. No. Good. Good. Nor, nor should you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Well, um, thank you all for your time and attention, and we'll try to get some more folks on uh, on tap again for next week again at 11. And I'm sorry, it looks like Jeannie had to drop off. I guess she was maybe she having did. issues again. Yeah, no, she had something she had to oh, do. She, okay. it was a, she had a little note up there. Very good. Okay. And Very good. Off well, to prison. Uh, she's huh? off to prison. She was off oh. to prison. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully she was invigorated by the spirit with new words to give them. Yeah. Uh huh. So, um, but thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And join us tonight at six for evening prayer. Okay. If you're around, we'll be on Facebook live at, uh, for evening prayer at six. And we'd love to have you join us for that. And, uh, if not, I'll see and talk to you guys either next week or this Sunday, if I see you Sunday. So God bless you all and have a blessed day. God bless. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.